Last week, we covered Freud and psychoanalysis. So how does Adlerian therapy differ from psychoanalysis? Well, we're about to find out. If you're interested in learning about Adlerian therapy techniques that might be helpful for you or that you could use in therapy with your clients, stay all the way to the end of the video. So what was Adler's view of human nature? Freud and Adler worked together very closely for years until ultimately uh, they disagreed about a lot of different things and Adler eventually broke away from Freud and deci decided to found the Society of Individual Psychology in 1912. Adler and other psychoanalysis agreed that culture, society, social factors, and relational factors such as relationships all were important in shaping the personality. So they moved away from Freud's biological and deterministic views. Adler also emphasized that where we come from is not as important as where we're striving to get to. So he again broke away from Freud's view of let's look at the childhood and where we're coming from and focused more on what are our goals, where are we trying to get to, what are we trying to create for ourselves rather than solely focusing on childhood experiences. Adler stressed understanding the whole person in the context of his or her life, so looking at those environmental factors, those relationship factors, and making sure to pay attention to those. The world is seen from the client's subjective frame of reference, which is described as phenomenological, phenomenological, uh, so subjective reality. And this was a very strong shift of focusing on the client's view and what was important to them and paying attention to their individual ways of being and their perceived uh, view of the world as opposed to focusing on other aspects. So basically paying attention to their vantage point and putting aside our own biases, which we've talked about in terms of our own assumptions, our own values. We talked about that during week two. So really trying to understand the client from a holistic standpoint. Adler believed we can be understood only in light of knowing the purposes and goals, goals towards which we're striving. This is part of why I asked you guys at the beginning of the semester in your introduction discussion post, what are your goals in terms of personal and professional goals? Where are you trying to get to? What's important to you? Not only because it helps me get to know you guys, but two, in terms of Adler's approach, it's very important to who you are. Who you might be is completely different if you're someone who, say, is trying to become a physician assistant versus someone who's trying to become a photographer. Very different goals, and likely the personality of those two individuals is very different. In terms of guiding the self-ideal, so this is striving for greater competence, not only for oneself, but for the common good of others. And you'll see this theme continue to come up in Adlerian therapy, where he was very community and socially focused. I know this might be really hard to read. Adler also focused on movement, basically movement towards something. So for example, towards our goals, if we were moving away from something such as avoiding or basically running from something that say we feared, um, movement against the self. So this is if there's some type of self-harm that's occurring or maybe suicidal thoughts that's occurring. Again, movement away from something versus against something. There's some differences there and then any type of ambivalent movement. And you can see here in the, the screenshot that there's different emotions, different potential diagnoses that are all tied to that. So Adler hugely believed in birth order, and this is basically the meaning that the client ascribes to this or different characteristics that might occur because of the birth order. So first we have the oldest child, and the oldest child, of course, tends to receive the most attention because they're first. And so they tend to be spoiled. They tend to be the center of attention. They, Adler believed, tend to be dependable and hardworking. However, once the next baby is born, they might feel as if they've been dethroned or maybe even robbed of love. Of love. And you can see this play out in movie scenes or TV shows. Or maybe you've seen it play out in your own life in terms of say siblings or cousins where the oldest might say something like I don't want a baby sister or I don't want a baby brother I want to be the only one. The second child um, if there's only two behaves as if they're in a race right because they were born second so now they feel like I have to compete I have to try and catch up they might always 
be running around trying to keep up with the oldest sibling. And so there's kind of this competition that often tends to occur. They might see the oldest child's weaknesses and say, okay, this is an area where I can stand out and shine and maybe achieve success where the oldest child is failing. So for example, if you've got, say your oldest child is good at sports or an old ch oldest child is good at sports, the younger child might focus on math or English or some other area where they can um, stand out and highlight or be able to show their success or their achievement. Next, we've got the middle child. They often might feel like they're squeezed out or like things are unfair. They might take this approach of poor me mentality. Or if they're raised in a family with conflict, they also might take the approach, a slightly different approach of maybe being the peacekeeper or the peacemaker within the family. Again, it depends on kind of bigger family dynamics that are occurring. The youngest child, the baby of the family, often tends to be pampered and spoiled. No surprise there. You've probably seen that or seen examples in movies or TV shows as well. Then lastly, we've got the only child. And the only child sometimes maybe won't learn to share or cooperate with other children. They might learn to deal with adults differently because they're treated differently as an only child. The idea of social interest is one of Adler's most significant and distinctive concepts. And he believed that this was impactful and beneficial to mental health if individuals were able to connect, were able to show that they had social interest. In terms of his idea or his thought process, mental health is measured by the degree to which we share with others and are concerned with others' welfare or are connected to others. So basically, if we express social interest through shared activity, cooperation, participation in the common good, and mutual respect, then he believed that we had higher mental health or better mental health versus if we were isolated or disconnected from others, that we would basically be dysfunctioning in terms of mental health. So he really embodied and believed in this idea of community feeling and the capacity to cooperate with others, contribute to something bigger than ourselves, being connected basically to all of humanity through this striving to make the world a better place and creating a sense of belonging. Life tasks, so these are pretty straightforward. Adler believed that we needed to achieve these life tasks. So this is building friendships, uh, establishing intimacy, contributing to society. And each of these tasks requires the development of psychological capacity for friendship, belonging, contributing to others, and by that contributing, it increases our own self-worth and our own ability for cooperation. And he believed that this was fundamental to human living and existence. Therapy goals. So the aim of therapy is to develop the client's sense of belonging, develop community feelings and social interest, as we've already seen and talked about, and emphasize health and well-being in general. So clients become discouraged because of maybe mistaken beliefs or faulty values or useless goals. And so really refocusing those mistaken beliefs or useless goals back towards what does the community need, what are social interests and connections, and thriving through those social connections. Uh, so basically taking a more optimistic approach rather than pathologizing clients is one of the benefits and one of the positives or upsides of this therapy approach rather than that more pathologizing or negative view. So family constellation, this includes parents, siblings, others in the home, life tasks, and early recollections. Basically, this is the family system before it was known as the family system. So you can see how Adler's views will impact later theories that we see in terms of family system. Early recollections, so these are used to verify how the client sees themselves others and life in general and it's also used to identify any behavioral patterns that the client might be engaging in either if those are healthy or unhealthy. This also includes stories and events that the client can remember from before the age of 10. So what are those early recollections that they can remember what stands out to them? And this is because we as individuals tend to conceptualize life according to previous experiences and often don't allow movement from those past experiences into new experiences. 
So this isn't necessarily paying attention to the past, but it's more about the client's perspective in the present. So basically because of how they view the past, how does that then impact their perception of who they are now, their worldview, and how do those experiences help us as therapists understand who this client is that's sitting in front of us. In terms of the lifestyle assessment, this is learning to understand goals and motivation of the client and understanding basically their psychological makeup. I talked about the lifestyle assessment in a different video, so make sure that you go and watch that. It can be really helpful for you as a therapist or just really helpful to understand what types of questions would you need to be asking to understand someone else. In terms of the lifestyle assessment and in terms of our therapist role and function of working with clients, kind of taking a step back and looking at everything on this slide, we want to make sure that we are taking a collaborative approach with each of these. We want to make sure that we are approaching the client, whether we're talking about family consolation or recollections, we want to make sure that we're cooperative, that we're helping the client focus their goals on not only what are they trying to get to, but does that align with kind of other factors that we've already talked about in terms of Adlerian therapy, such as the social aspects, collaborating and connecting with others. And we want to make sure as therapists in terms of our role and our functioning that we're being respectful and trustful and, and developing trust between the client and ourselves in order to further that relationship and the client's growth. Our function also includes, according to Adler, he believed that our role was to basically help the client in terms of where they were and help them see, I guess you would say the bigger picture, if you will. So he thought of the client as someone who was sitting in a dark room and they maybe couldn't find the exit. And so he believed that our role as the therapist was to help illuminate the room, to help the client find their way out of that darkness and to help them move towards an alternative way of feeling, being an alternative way of living, something that was more current with achieving those life tasks and again, becoming more connected with the community. So therapy procedures, these are fun. I think that this helps lay out therapy in a way that really makes sense. These aren't rigid steps, but they're more weaving threads to a tapestry as we develop our relationship with the client. So phase one is establishing that relationship. So setting the groundwork for making sure that the relationship is supportive, collaborative, educational. So helping the client learn more about themselves and understanding themselves. It's encouraging and the, in general, the therapeutic process is encouraging. It's a person to person approach. So connecting with the client individualistically where he or she is at and making sure that not only are we doing that in an encouraging way, but that we're also helping them move towards their goals, helping them build awareness of their strengths, and helping them identify whatever those problems are that they're coming to us with. Phase two is assessing the individual's psychological dynamics. So this is where that style of life comes back in to gain better understanding of the client and their psychological dynamics. We talked about that, as I mentioned, in one other video. Phase three is encouraging self-understanding and insight. So using interpretations as the therapist to help the client gain a better understanding of who they are. And I talked about this again in the other video, but an example is uh, the therapist comes up with some type of hunch and then checks in with the client in terms of that. And a good way to check in is to say something like, I could be wrong or correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm wondering if X, Y, Z. So for example, I could be wrong, but I'm guessing that this relationship with your current boyfriend is impacted by your previous relationship with your ex and how he treated you, as an example, off the top of my head. So because you're coming from an approach of curiosity, I'm just curious or I'm wondering or correct me if I'm wrong, it doesn't create defenses in the client because you're coming from that place of help me understand what's going on with you or help me understand what I'm missing here. So there's no hitting goals. The purpose is purely to understand the client and by understanding them better, you're then able to ideally help them move towards their goals. And then reorientation and reeducation 
This is where things become action oriented as you bring all of it together and say, okay, we have a better understanding of who you are. Now, what are we going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? How are your actions and behaviors going to change? How are you going to reorient and move towards your goals, start to take action towards those goals and be encouraged um, from the therapeutic standpoint and from the therapeutic relationship to take action towards those goals. Group therapy, according to Adler, provides a social context in which members can develop a sense of belonging, community, and social relatedness. The rationale for group therapy from an Adlerian perspective was that our problems are ma mainly social in nature, and so by providing that social context, it enables clients to work through whatever those concerns or problems are. It enables the client to share the early recollections, which increases group cohesiveness. The action-oriented strategies for behavior change are implemented to help group members work together to challenge unhelpful or erroneous beliefs about themselves, about life, about others, or worldview. This approach was time-limited in nature, so not therapy for in forever and infinity. Inferior feelings can be challenged and counteracted effectively. So one of the main benefits of group therapy, on top of everything that we've already mentioned, is that it can be really helpful to have other individuals validate what the therapist is saying. So for example, if you as the therapist say something to your client like, wow, you're getting really good at this. I can see that you're taking action. I can see that you're using the strategies that we've talked about. You're doing so good. The client, the client might kind of blow you off like, yeah, yeah, you're supposed to say that. You're my therapist. Whereas if they hear that from multiple group members, you know, two or three people or three or four people are all saying those things. It validates what the action that they're taking and what they've been working on or doing from more than just you, their therapist. So that can be hugely beneficial. Another benefit is that altruism side of things. Again, Adler really believed that we need to contribute to the community and contribute to others. And so by contributing, by helping someone else out, by maybe giving them some piece of advice or by encouraging them, we ourselves are getting that altruistic side of things because we're helping someone else out, which Adler really believed was beneficial. Diversity. So Adler was really huge in terms of, uh, I'll jump to that bottom bullet, advocating for equality in women. And this was very different if you think about the times that were occurring. Um, women and minorities often felt inferior. They were often entreated in an inferior way. And Adler was one of the individuals who uh, really advocated for social justice, for social change, which is pretty cool. He also focused on multicultural aspects. We talked about how he took a different stance from Freud in terms of paying attention to different aspects such as age, ethnicity, lifestyle, uh, sexual aspects and orientation, gender differences, and paid attention to how those all could impact therapy or impact the client's life. He was more cooperative and focused on socially oriented values. Um, and he also tended to be more flexible in terms of applying different action oriented techniques and strategies to help the clients explore their problems from a cultural context and standpoint. And again, he was one of the first therapists to really do this and incorporate it into therapy. Shortcomings from a diversity perspective. So these are really important to pay attention to because again, this was developed in a very westernized setting. So paying attention to the nuclear aspect of family. So, you know, family from a Western standpoint is a mom, a dad, and 2.5 kids and a white pick offense. Uh, however, it's really important to pay attention to the fact that that's not going to be everybody's nuclear family. So for example, depending on the culture, a family or a family setting might be individuals all living and sharing in, you know, like the kitchen and the common areas, and then maybe they have individual bedrooms and living space for multiple families. So two or three siblings, as well as grandparents, maybe aunts and uncles, all living under one roof and maybe sharing those common areas. And so paying attention to differences in terms of cultural factors that might be playing, playing out for your clients or might be occurring for your clients. 
Uh, so that is one of the downsides or shortcomings is paying attention to, again, when was this theory developed and the fact that some cultural factors might not have been considered during that time. This approach tends to focus on the self with the self being that locus of control, so that internal locus of control and internal responsibility, which may be problematic for some clients, especially some clients who are focused or have more of an external locus of control approach, or individuals who come from a more culturalistic, uh, sorry, not culturalistic, but collectivistic standpoint rather than an individualistic standpoint. So hopefully that makes sense. We, you know, in Western society tend to be very individualistic in terms of our values. And I think we talked about that during the values lecture as well. Whereas some clients are, again, going to come from more of a collectivistic value standpoint. And so this therapy approach might not drive well, very, very well for them or work very well for them. Exploring past childhood experiences and early memories. Some clients might not be interested in that. Some clients might be like, hey, I need to fix what's happening right now. I don't care about childhood stuff. That's way in the past. Why are we wasting our time focusing on that or thinking about that? Some therapy clients might expect the therapist to be the expert. And again, cultural factors can play a role here where, hey, I'm coming to you. You're the expert. Tell me what to do. Tell me what to fix. Tell me what to change. Whereas this approach doesn't do that. This approach is very collaborative and very much let's work together and come together to work on whatever you need to work on. I'm not the expert here. or I'm not going to be the one to tell you what to change or what to fix. We're going to work together on those things. And that might not work for some individuals or some clients or some cultures where, you know, some cultures or some individuals, they want that expert or they want you to just tell them what to do. This might be inappropriate for some individuals or cultures because of how family is viewed. And so some cultures or some families or individuals are very kind of close hold or, or close knit in terms of, you know, we don't share our problems with family. We don't share the fact that, you know, someone is in jail or that someone has a drug problem. We don't, we don't share those family skeletons. We keep those all internally. We don't talk about those things. And so that could be a problem because, again, this approach is very family-oriented, very relationship and socially oriented. And so Adlerian therapists will likely want to talk about and discuss and explore those things and how those things potentially impacted whoever the client is, whereas some clients might not want to explore those things or bring those things up or talk about those things. So these are all reasons why from a diversity standpoint, this therapy approach might have some shortcomings. So this is research done by Levon and Schiffron in 2020, and they looked at early recollections in neuroscience, which I think is really interesting. So Adler's reason for going back to the person's childhood was to obtain, as he said, a simpler picture of the style of life. It was therefore irrelevant for him, to him, like Adler didn't care about if the memories were real or if they were made up or imagined or if they were from an earlier or later period of childhood, he cared more about understanding the client's attitude, understanding their perspective and their life approach. Basically, psychologically understanding who is this person sitting in front of him based on those early childhood recollections and using those to reveal and understand the client. Each early recollection contains all of the basic concepts of Adlerian theory. So for example, that holistic approach that we talked about, movement that we talked about, belonging, social interest, creativity, strategies in terms of towards action and making change happen, and achieving that overall goal of belonging, achieving those life tax tasks that we talked about. So According to Adler, early recollections provided a gold mine of information. And you can see that if you watch the um, lifestyle assessment video, how it just provides all this information about the client. So the self is essentially a memory or more accurately, a set of memories. So let's look at this. The human brain is composed of over 100 billion neurons and each neuron may connect to up to 10,000 other neurons passing signals to each other via as many as a thousand trillion synaptic connections to form neural networks. That's insane and pretty intense. 
The essential function of each of these neural networks is to receive, store, and process information from the environment and then be able to integrate all of that data into previous information so that we're able to respond in an appropriate manner, in an adaptive manner, in a behavioral pattern that makes sense. So this active process can be referred to as learning, to memorizing, and all of this is happening at the synaptic level. So basically the brain never stops learning or changing based on memories and based on new experiences that we go through. The ability of the mind to change the structure and strength of synaptic connections is collectively referred to as brain plasticity or synaptic plasticity. And throughout our lives, different experiences are constantly restructuring those memories and restructuring those synapses to basically change who we are, right? So if you think about who you were 10 years ago, you're probably a very different person now based on your life experiences, based on your goals now versus who you were 10 years ago. So consequently, each new experience and each remembered event or fact, the brain is kind of constantly and always re rewiring the physical structure and influencing our behaviors and our feelings accordingly. And so because of that rewiring, we're basically always in this motion of change or always in this process of change, which is really fascinating as a therapist thinking about that and how that might play out for our clients. In terms of Adler's teleological thoughts and approach, it's the sense that human motivation, emotion, and action are all goal-directed. What happens when we achieve a goal? We get this boost of dopamine. And so the hormone dopamine is released when we're striving towards a goal, when we achieve a goal. So let's think about this in terms of the Stone Age, right? Let's go back a little bit. People might have been excited to find a fig tree, right? You think about where did food come from? You had to go scavenge and hunt it and find it and, you know, go gather it. And so you're like, oh, yes, we found food for the day. We're going to actually eat. That excitement had a purpose because the fruit was a source of energy. It was a source of survival. And so because of that shot of dopamine, people were then able to remember like, oh, where did we find that fig tree? I remember I found it over here. And so that dopamine then reinforces those synaptic and neural networks. When one strives for something, when we strive for something, the brain secretes dopamine into certain circuits to reinforce that behavior, similar to the sweetness of the taste of the fig. It increases the likelihood that the action will be repeated in the future. And there's all types of situations and all types of behavioral patterns or actions that you could see how this would be applied to. So dopamine is also secreted when a child receives a positive feedback and therefore is necessary to encourage or motivate the child. So you can see how encouragement, according to Adler, is a huge part of therapy. The therapeutic process is a technique that we can use in therapy because we're reinforcing whatever that action is that we want our clients to be taking. I want to highlight Gwen. There's two different cases in the textbook. Um, I want to highlight this one because I think the therapist does a really good job of laying this out in terms of paying to paying attention to being careful about making assumptions, not making assumptions. For some people, and especially for young therapists, as you're starting out, as you're a novice in the field, it can take a lot of practice to not automatically make assumptions about our clients or make assumptions about the things our clients are saying or the things that they're doing. And so I think that the therapist in the case study here does a really good job of kind of checking herself in and taking a pause and saying, well, hold on, this is my worldview, which is different from my client or Gwen's worldview. How do I make sure to be careful not to assume what she's going through? Even though we're both female, we're still very different people and we've experienced life very differently. Um, so I really like how that's laid out here. And I think it's also important to normalize this for new therapists. It can become, it can be really difficult to learn this skill. So here are the discussion posts. There's a bunch of discussion questions in the textbook. It was really hard to pick just two because there's a lot of different things that we could talk about. And again, if we were in class, we would spend quite a, quite a bit of time discussing the different discussions that are in your textbook. 
So techniques, I'm not going to cover all of these, but I have chosen a couple to cover and we'll go over those in the next slides. So paradox intention, uh, you guys who are parents have probably done this to your kids at some point. So the mind often does the opposite of what we want it to do. When you're actively trying to suppress a thought or worry, what tends to happen? So for example, if someone tells you don't think about a dog with purple spots, that's almost impossible not to do. If you're like, don't think about it, don't think about it. Now you're like, well, now I'm thinking about it. <laughs> and so the longer you try to avoid the thing that you fear, the bigger that fear grows. So even if we know avoidance increases its power, it's still very natural and we still end up responding to things by avoiding them out of fear, out of not wanting to deal with it, whatever the situation is. And you'll see this play out for your clients quite a bit where uh, they come in and you're like, did you do the thing? Did you engage in the behavior? And they're like, nope, I avoided it. I just didn't want to deal with it this week. So how to use paradoxical intention in your life? Well, if you suffer from fear or anxiety, according to Adler, this is what you should do. Um, is to use this paradoxical intention. So identify the thing that makes you fearful or that causes anxiety and look for ways to make it even bigger. So for example, if you have a fear of feel failing, then consider things that you don't want to do around that thing and then set yourself up to basically go do it. So basically you're saying, hey, I know that I'm gonna fail at this thing and I'm just gonna go do it anyways. And so he would say, start putting yourself in situations where you know you're going to fail. And by basically repeatedly exposing yourself to that thing over time, it's no longer going to cause extreme fear or dread. And you're going to eventually, because you've gotten used to it, you're going to say, okay, I'm not avoiding it anymore or I'm not afraid of it anymore. Acting as if. Let me pause this video. So. I really like this TED talk. Um, it talks about acting as if, so if there's something that you wanna be better at, for example, being more confident in public speaking, Adler would say, okay, we'll start to act as if you're already that person. In this video, she talks about body language to help shape that and help engage in that. And she talks about power poses. So basically going back to this example, if you wanted to be more confident in public speaking, as you're practicing for public speaking, you would like strike a power pose and say, okay, I'm going to pretend or I'm going to act as if I already have this confidence in my public speaking. And by acting as if, you eventually start to become that thing. So it's an interesting concept because you're basically pretending to be someone you're not or trying to be someone you're not. And by doing that, you're then able to get there. So really interesting. And this would be fun if you guys wanted to do some different experimenting to try it out in your own life to see how it goes. Catching oneself. So this is the process of we tend to repeat old patterns and old behaviors, ineffective behaviors. And so if you're someone who, for example, is in a relationship and you guys tend to fight, Adler would say, OK, let's catch you or catch yourself either in the argument or before the argument starts and pay attention, kind of pause yourself, if you will, um, if that's possible mid-argument, and kind of pay attention to what am I thinking right now? What am I feeling? What am I saying? What am I doing? What's occurring? And catch yourself in that moment and then identify what's going on, what's happening. Are you engaging in the action that you want to be engaging in? Or are you engaging in an ineffective behavior or a behavior that's not moving you towards your goals. Pushing the button. So this is an interesting technique and it helps the client become aware of their role in contributing to unpleasant feelings. And so the textbook talks about this in terms of, and gives a little role play of a client where the therapist basically says, okay, let's find a spot to push the button. So for example, your left elbow, this is now your depression button. Anytime you feel depressed, you're going to push that button. Okay, so hold on. What if you don't want to push that button? What if you don't want to push the depression button? What if you want to push the happy button? This is the happy button. Anytime you want to feel happy or feel positive emotions, you're going to push this button. And so it's the concept or the idea of giving the client the control to feel how they want to feel. I thought this was a cute little meme over here. Uh, 
encouragement is a distinctive intervention and it's also a part of the phase of therapy or the process of therapy, which we saw earlier. And so Adler would say encouragement is hugely important and it is helpful in terms of moving the client towards where they're wanting to go, similar to that idea of dopamine by helping encourage them you're reinforcing that positive behavior that you want to be seeing. You guys have probably heard of fixed mindset versus growth mindset. If the picture on the screen is too small, that's basically what it's showing is fixed versus growth mindset, which is from Car Carol Dweck's research. She's a professor at Stanford University, and she's not proven what Adler taught years and years ago. So is praise versus encouragement, are they the same thing? Are they different? Is one better than the other? Well, in terms of children, praise is not good. Dweck found that praise can actually hamper risk taking. So children who are praised for being smart when they accomplished a task chose easier tasks in the future because they didn't want to risk making a mistake, which is really interesting. On the other hand, children who were encouraged for their efforts were more willing to choose challenging tasks when given a choice. So encouragement is the, in terms of encouraging the deed or the effort is more important than encouraging the doer. In other words, instead of saying, you got an A, I'm so proud of you, try saying, congratulations, you worked hard, you deserve it. It's a really subtle difference, but it changed the, the perception of your child. So the difference between encouragement and praise can be difficult to grasp for those who believe in praise and have seen immediate results. We've all seen, uh, or most of us have probably seen, you know, when you praise a child, their face lights up, they beam, they're really excited, they're really happy because you just gave them praise. However, it doesn't have positive long lasting effects. Praise is not encouraging because it, teach, it teaches children to become approval junkies. They learn to depend on others to evaluate their worth and encouragement actually leads to, whereas encouragement actually leads to self-reflection and self-evaluation instead of relying on other people for that worth or for to be valued. So let's go back to the, child, the fact that children like praise. Praise is like candy. A little can be very satisfying, but too much can definitely cause problems, toothaches, dentist visits. Awareness is key here. So notice if your kids are becoming addicted to praise as if they need it all the time. And those who want to change from praise to encouragement, it can be kind of awkward at first. It can be uncomfortable as you're making that shift, but it can also be really helpful because you're helping your children learn to look for encouragement. And in the end, you're helping in terms of proving, improving those long-term effects of, you know, looking for challenges and working towards challenges versus only looking for praise. Externalizing. So sometimes it can be easier to talk about the problem when we change the way we look at it. And this is a really good example of how Adler's work ended up influencing therapies and theories that we'll see later on in the semester, such as narrative therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy. So what is externalizing? Well, this is talking about the problem as if it's something separate from you and referring to the problem such as it or giving it a name, as you can see here, the worry monster. This can help with perspective taking. It can help with kind of taking that step back and looking at the problem outside of ourselves versus internal to ourselves. The question, so this was used to identify symptoms or problems that the client was experiencing. The question is, how would your life be different or how would you, what would you be doing differently if you did not have this symptom or this problem? And you see an example in your textbook of this where a therapist basically asks, how would your life be different if you weren't experiencing the symptom or this problem? And the client says, well, you know, if I weren't depressed, I would be going out with friends more. So this can be really helpful to increase insight, increase awareness, and basically help the client in terms of self-reflection of, hey, what would be different here? Meta means loving kindness, and it's a meditation used to show loving kindness towards ourselves, towards others, and to help relieve stress. So I created a whole separate video for this, and it can be really, really beneficial, as you can imagine, for our clients, because what happens, our clients tend to come in and they treat themselves the worst, like they talk negatively to themselves, they call themselves names, they beat up on themselves, 
And so it can be really beneficial to help the client take that energy from a negative approach of treating themselves terribly, talking negatively to themselves, and moving that energy into a more positive and healthy way through this meditation and through having them practice and use this meditation regularly. So go check out that video. And these are my references. Thanks for watching.